All right, First Thessalonians chapter number three, if you will. Uh, we continue our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of First Thessalonians. Uh, where we left off, if you look at verse number, well, let's just read down verse one to three and then have a word of prayer. Uh, and we left off in verse three last week. First Thessalonians three, verse one, Paul says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto let's pray Heavenly Father we do thank you for uh, your, your son the Lord Jesus Christ we thank you for his shed blood on Calvary's cross which gives us that life everlasting Father we thank you for that that it's by simple grace through faith plus no works today in the dispensation of grace that we have that justified position forever before you in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your holy scriptures. And Father, as we look into them this morning, uh, may you give us great insight and understanding and wisdom. May you give us a greater appreciation of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we uh, take these things and by faith apply them into our lives as believers until you come. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, last week we left off. The Apostle Paul had to leave... He had to leave Thessalonica because in Acts 17, those Jews and Gentiles, those, those uh, lost Jews and Gentiles, constantly persecuted the Apostle Paul. And they used uh, the government to put a bond on Jason's home. And you just read that in Acts 17, we went over that, and said that if Paul comes back, that would be the, the, the penalty. And so Paul had to leave. He, went, he left and went to Berea. The, those unbelieving Jews followed him there as well. And then he went over to Athens. Now notice in, in chapter number uh, 3, verse 1, he says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, in other words, when he couldn't take it, uh, he wanted to know how they do, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. Uh, God gives us freedom of choice and freedom of grace to, to reason things. Notice he says, we thought it good. Using the mind of Christ, Paul says, you know what? We can't go back as far as he himself but he, he was able to send one of his ministers, his son in the faith, Timothy. Look at verse 2. And sent Timotheus, and that's also Timothy, who, who he writes the book of First and Second Timothy to. Notice he says, our brother. Remember we ended with saying a brother, uh, the Bible says a brother is born for affliction. A, bro a brother is born for adversity, excuse me. Uh, God gives brothers to have your back. That's what brothers do. And Timothy was that. Not just a brother in the Lord because he was saved and a member of the, of the household of God. He was a true brother. He had Paul's back. And that's what brothers are, are there for. Notice he's also, verse 2, a minister of God. He's a minister. He ministers God's grace to saints. He says, and he's a fellow laborer. Remember that issue of labor. The difference between work and labor is the fact that labor has to do with hardness, enduring hardness. Labor is hard. It's hard work. work. Paul tells us the work of faith, the labor of love. Labor has to do with something being hard. It's going to take some effort and some strength. Well, he's a fellow laborer. Timothy was on the front lines of the gospel of Christ. Notice he says, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. The good news of Christ. And remember, I like to put this on the board. I, I can't see whether they can see it or not. But for you guys there, I'll, I'll say it out loud as well. I'll do it from this side. When we talk about, he talks about the gospel of Christ. When we talk about the word Christ, yeah, when, the way that Paul, you know, people say that's uh, the Messiah. That's true. The anointed one and so forth. The Christ. It is. But what's, what, when the Bible talks about Christ, it's more than just the Messiah, the anointed one. The word Christ talks about suffering and glory. Okay? Peter says to Israel, he says, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall be revealed. Uh, he's called the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to give him his due. You know, I, I train my, myself not to call him just Jesus unless there's verses about it, okay? I put Jesus in here. Because Jesus is, is his name, but it's his humanity that's focused. So when it's just Jesus, the focus is his humanity, okay? He was a real man. He was of the seed of David. He was, a, he was actual flesh and blood, okay? in his incarnation, in the flesh. The word Lord, Paul says, that means the righteous judge, okay? 
when you see that word Lord, that has to do, when the Apostle Paul talks about it, that he's a judge. He's the righteous judge. And the is exclusive. Exclusive. The Lord Jesus Christ is his name. When he rose from the dead, Luke said, the Lord Jesus. Put those two words together, the Lord Jesus. Because he is now resurrected. So the, he's exclusive. Lord, the righteous judge. He is the righteous judge. He's the son of man. He, he became a man, his humanity. But that focus on Christ has to do with the suffering and glory. Okay? And that's why Paul calls him a minister of God. <clears throat> Look at verse 2. Our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. Timothy was a partaker of those afflictions. And if you and I who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in this lost and dying world, we can choose to be a part of that affliction. Now the main affliction is going to be, today, is going to be rejection. Okay? Rejection, isolation, and so forth. Shame, reproach, those types of things. Uh, when Paul says we suffer with Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father. He's not suffering physically. Nobody's attacking him. Although that could happen to us, it happened to Paul. But the way he's, he's suffering, his long suffering is his truth is being rejected. And when you have truth and the truth of the word of God, it will be rejected, you'll be isolated, you'll be spurned, so forth. Well, that's part of the suffering, the afflictions of Christ. You're going to stick with the truth. Notice what happened here. It was based upon their faith in God's word that they were suffering. Let's look at that. Verse number two, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God. And by the way, you may suffer in your own family. I hear from saints all the time whose spouse rejects the truth of God's word and in essence rejects them as well. Isn't that interesting? Well, see, he talks about the gospel of Christ, the good news. The good news is that when you suffer with him, you shall also be glorified together with him. In that future coronation when God the Father anoints the Lord Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the, in the heavens. Remember, the twofold purpose of God, Paul says, Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And he focused on the earth all the way to Acts 9 with the salvation of Saul, who's also called Paul. He's a Jew and a Gentile in one body. Timothy was too, type of the body of Christ. And from that time, he had just only mentioned the earth. He prophesied through the prophets. That's called pro pro prophetic scriptures, okay? The scriptures are the prophets. But then when you come to Paul, God, he says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. His kingdom, his king's domain and dominion is in two spheres. He kept hidden, that's what the mystery of Christ is, how he's going to deal with the heavenly places. Heavenly places. And that's Paul's ministry. You learn about that in Paul's epistles. And notice what he says here, verse number 2 again. He says, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. That King James word, establish, is a wonderful word. Because you'll see two different words in there. And sometimes, even in your King James, the, uh, the, the people who, who uh, publish the Bible, they'll change it because they don't understand. But there's two words Paul uses, or the Bible uses. Establish. And then establish. Okay? Now, when they see establish or establish, they'll either add an E to make it that or take an E away. But if you look at these two words, they knew what they were doing. They used both of them. Establish has to do with a process, a process of edification, okay? Usually it's from the inside out. In other words, like a man would do it, uh, inside out, excuse me, outside in, pardon me. Outside in, for example, I am a man and I, my job is to establish saints. That's the process we're doing when we study God's word, outside in. Establish, on the other hand, you see the word stabilize there, stable, to, to make you stable. This thing is not stable, it moves if I put too much pressure. But just imagine standing fast, fastened. Sta this is the end result, that's right, the end result. This is, you, you're at the end of the process, okay? Establish. That's usually from the inside out. And this one done by man primarily, this one done by God, this God himself. God is a God of process, but he wants you to get there. 
when you grow in sound doctrine, you're being established. But when you have that doctrine understanding, that doctrinal understanding secure, you're established, okay? So that's the it. One is the process, one is the end result. Uh, let, me, let me show you something. Go to Romans chapter 16. Hold your hand there. This is, a, this is a good passage to show that. Look at Romans chapter number 16 and down to verse 25. Romans 16, 25. The Apostle Paul ends this great book of this doctrinal treatise on the foundation of grace salvation. The first book that Paul that God puts it in, in, the, in the order of Paul's epistle, the logical order, not the chronological. Romans was written after, Romans was the sixth book written. Uh, Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, um, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, then Romans. Well, the book of Romans, if, when you get to the end of it, you should be established in understanding your salvation. That is by grace through faith plus nothing. Now, at the end of the book, notice how Paul ends it. Verse 25, Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him. Now Paul is going to give God the due as he as he you heard of a doxology when he's going to he's going to say, okay, he's going to hand it over to God. Now to him that is a power to now notice establish you. Make your faith stable. According to my gospel, Paul calls it my gospel. Paul is the only one who calls it my gospel. Romans 2, verse 16. In the day that God shall judge the secrets of men according to my gospel, he personalizes it because it's unique to him, my gospel. Peter and uh, 11, they had the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. Paul's gospel is the gospel of the grace of God. And when he says my gospel, Romans 2.16, my gospel, he says it here, Romans 16.25, and in 2 Timothy 2, verse 7 and 8, he says, Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That issue of my gospel, that which is unique to the Apostle Paul. Notice here he says, and the preaching. Paul says that preaching is warning and teaching. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the what? The mystery. How is God going to prepare us for the heavenly places? Paul says it's called the mystery. And so you get, you get prepared for the judgment seat of Christ, called the judgment seat of Christ, and you get prepared for the heavenly places, the heavenly kingdom, through the mystery of Christ. And that's why he calls it the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept, it's called a mystery because it was kept secret since the world began. And that's why I said God only let information know, uh, be known how he would redeem the earth back into himself from satanic captivity. That was through the one new man, Adam, who failed. So then another Adam comes, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he succeeds. Well, how is God going to reconcile the heavenly places? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He has a heavenly kingdom too, 2 Timothy 4, 18. Well, it's going to be through the body of Christ. That's what the body of Christ was created for. Where the church, which is his body, he's the head. The Lord Jesus Christ, even though he's going to rule and reign on the earth, he has the body of Christ to sit with him in his heavenly kingdom. Some will reign, some will not. But all do go to heaven. Your reigning is based upon your suffering with him in his truth. That's what we're doing now. I'm trying to establish you in this truth. So when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, when you get to the point where the Father says it's time to coronate the kingdom, we can be prepared. You don't have to wait to the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be too late. You do that now. That's what establish. That's the process of sanctification. Okay. Now, look what he says. According to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. God didn't let anybody know it to Paul. But now, that's the dispensation of grace, is made manifest. And then, remember, God wants us to supplement that understanding with knowing all the scripture rightly divided. And by the scriptures of the prophets, I call them here the prophetic scriptures, because God wants you to know his word, all his word rightly divided. According to the commandment of the everlasting God. This is God's commandment. Made known. Now, before it was only made known to one nation, Israel. Now, his word is made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. 
And God has this faith that he wants us to obey. That's what Paul is saying you're going to suffer in. Go back, go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. So it is that information that Timothy is sent to, to build in, in, into them. Notice verse 2. He says at the end, to establish you and, okay, look, to establish them, give them the truth. But he also says, and to comfort you concerning your faith. Is it warm in here, Dion? Yeah. All right. We're going to... Delaney, can you uh, turn that off? You'll just pull pull that bottom panel down. Yeah. And it'll just say, and you see off, and just switch the thing to off. You see it? Perfect. Thank you. All right. I, I'm, I normally stay out. I just want to make sure you guys aren't are, are, are too cool in there. All right. So he's going to establish. So Timothy's job is to go. Now notice, not only to establish you, the, the saints, and to comfort you concerning your faith. Why would they need comfort? Because they were going through satanic affliction. Notice the next verse. It says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Now notice, Paul is saying that because of their faith, because of the doctrine, they will suffer the, the, these different afflictions that I was talking about. You see them in Acts 17. I mean, think about if you were Jason, who Paul stayed with him when he was at in, 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 in Thessalonica. The government says, knock, knock, knock. Yes, uh, yes, government. We will take your house if we see the Apostle Paul anywhere around here. I mean, they were just having the Bible study like we have it now. But because the Apostle Paul, the power that he had, and obviously who he was, the satanic policy of evil to hinder what God's doing, he, they got the government. Two things that, that Satan likes to use. He likes to use religion, and he likes to use politics. Let me say that. Because I'm, I'm not going to say government. Politics. God likes faith, and he likes government. The powers that be. But if you, I don't have to tell you guys, we're in that political realm right now where next, next, next year, November, a, a new president will be elected. And you see all this, you can't turn the TV on, all these debates and all this, all these politics. Nobody's going to get anything done. Can I tell you all that? Isn't they just talk, 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 talk. <laughs> That's politics. God, God wants faith in government. Satan uses religion and politics. Who are the people who killed the Lord Jesus Christ? Religious, unbelieving Jews and the Roman Empire, Pontius Pilate. Who killed Paul? <coughs> Religious Jews... The Rome, Rome. He couldn't be crucified because he was a Roman citizen, but they cut his head off. The point is, that's the two things that's going to... And that's what was going on here. These people were being afflicted by the religious folks, and then those lost people being energized to use government to harm them. But Paul says, don't allow that to move you. Verse 3, that no man should be moved, either quit or fall apart by these afflictions. Now notice he says, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. The believer, because of the, the lost world that we live in, the Christ-rejecting world, uh, we, took, we took Christmas parents to uh, the fishery. I forgot, the Nimbus, is it called Nimbus? I forgot what it's called. Anyway, it was a fishery right off of Hazel and, and uh, Highway 50. And basically it just shows you the fish coming up the American River, and well, they, they make a long trek from like Alaska, they're salmon, salmon, and then they go to Pacific Ocean, all this stuff, but they make their way down here to the valley and the American River. And they go through this place, it's called the fish hatchery. And if you know anything about salmon, they go against the grain, right? They go, they go against the, the, uh, the current. And so by the time they get there, they're big and they're, they're all banged up from rocks and other, and they're, they're ready to, the, the females are ready to spawn. But we learned something that when a, when the salmon get there, and and, and they're, they 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 have they're ready to spawn their their little eggs, they die. So they'll get a thousand eggs, they'll shoot them out, and then they die. Interesting enough. But the issue of that was to, it was interesting. Watch them at the end of their journey. The waters are flowing this way, and they're just slamming into the water. 
Well, I, when I see stuff like that, I say that's how we believers live in this world. The world is says the course of this world goes this way. God's thinking goes that way. And we're constantly fighting against the course of this world. Everything. They call evil good and good evil. It talks about Lot when he was in Sodom and Gomorrah, which you might as well say that's where we are here. Especially if you guys in the Bay Area, close to San Francisco. It might as well be Sodom out there. It said it vexed his righteous soul. Well, it affects our righteous soul. But those things will be rewarded, the Lord says. Notice verse 3. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Uh, go to Philippians chapter number 1. Let me show you how Paul says it there. Philippians chapter number 1. We have a great privilege as believers. Philippians chapter number 1. Look at verse 29. Philippians chapter number 1, verse 29. For unto you, that's the believer, the grace believer, it is given in the behalf of who? Christ. Now, now remember, when you think Christ, remember it has to do with suffering and glory. So on behalf of Christ. That's why he didn't say on behalf of the Lord. That's why he didn't say on behalf of Jesus. When Paul says it like that, on behalf of Christ, it means to suffer with him and receive his glory. That reign. Okay? You got to suffer with him in his truth, the mystery. Now watch this. Paul writes, it is, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to what? Believe on him. <clears throat> and Paul wants you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, after being beat down by the government. But also to suffer for his sake. Interesting. Having the same conflict which he saw in me. They saw Paul go through this in Acts 16. And now here to be in me. Where was Paul when he wrote this book? He was in prison. And they saw him suffering for the truth. Paul was a prisoner of Jesus Christ for his Gentiles. But he was a prisoner and he was suffering. Okay? A prisoner means pointed to death in the scripture when you look up the word prisoner. Now go back with me if you will. That's what it means that we're appointed there unto. Verse number four. Basically he's saying this, you won't be accepted by the world if you're a grace believer. You just won't. And when I say the world, I'm talking about your spouse sometimes, your family, your friends. That old church that you went to. Because, notice in verse number four. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that ye that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Now, let me talk about that. That is your suffering tribulation, because notice Paul did not say that we're going to go through the tribulation, or what they call the great tribulation in, in the Gospels. When Paul talks about tribulation, he's talking about the trials the temptations that come with just being a believer. There's a difference between, when he talks about tribulation, tribulation. Remind me of Romans chapter 5. This tribulation, he, he's not talking about the tribulation period, or what was also called the 70th week of Daniel, or the uh, 70th week of Daniel, uh, that seven years, also called the great tribulation. And you say to the Bible calls it in Jeremiah the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's what you have to remember. Jacob is Israel. His, 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 his fleshly born name, Jacob's trouble. So that last seven years of that period before the Lord returns, his future from us, it's going to be hot, particularly in the Middle East there, where the land of God is. The point is, that's their time. This appointed tribulation is just the normal course of a grace believer living in this Christ rejecting world. Because notice here, the tribulation Paul talks about is not a future tribulation, period. It is something that already happened to them. Let's look at it, verse 4. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before, this so when he was there in Acts 17, Timothy and Silas told them with Paul, before that we, that's the believers, should suffer tribulation. Even as it came to what? Pass. So it happened already by the time he wrote the book. Uh, Dodie made these up for us, so I appreciate it. Uh, this is about the most 
accurate, at least in, in my understanding, reading uh, the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. He wrote this book in AD 51 about, okay? It's the second book he wrote. That means that not too long after he was there, he wrote back to them in this book, early in this one. And they had already gone through these particular tribulations. Paul actually told them, here's what's going to happen, guys. When, when I leave, they, the policy of evil is going to come. You know, I warn people, when you learn this message, understand that Satan doesn't want you to know it. So the, the, the satanic attack, the, the, it comes. It comes. I, I see it all the time and time again. Paul told them, and it came to pass, and you know. Now, Here's, here's a minister's heart. I, I understand the apostle here, because notice what he says in verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear. By the way, look at chapter 5. Let me just finish about this tribulation versus tribulation period. <clears throat> look at chapter 5, verse 9. Look at, look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. Just for those, because you're going to have people tell you that the body of Christ is going to go through the tribulation or tribulation period. But what Paul says, we'll be raptured or, or the resurrection of the body of Christ will take place first. Watch this. Verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. He wants you to have your thinking properly. Put on that breastplate of faith and love. That's what righteousness is in, in Ephesians, the breastplate of righteousness, Ephesians 6. And for an helmet, now, what piece of armor, what, 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 pe what part of your body does a, a helmet protect? The head, the mind. That's right, the head, where you're thinking. For that helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, he's not saying the hope of salvation as in, man, I hope when I die, I go to heaven. You have that if you trusted the blood of Christ. You trust Christ in his shed blood on Calvary alone. This hope... And it's not a hope like a wish. It's a hope that's going to happen. This salvation is the salvation from the tribulation period. Salvation or saved doesn't always mean your soul. Uh, saved from hell. So you could be saved from hell and the lake of fire. That, that's your initial salvation, okay? That's the salvation of your soul. But you're also being saved daily from confusion so he's saving you daily. That's the first Corinthians 15. When Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, wherein also ye receive wherein ye stand, if you keep in memory, if you keep in memory, by also, by also you are saved if you keep in memory. And he's, they're saved if they keep in memory. Saved from what? Saved from the confusion of satanic opposition to the truth. So that's, a, that's, your, that's your walk there. You can be saved from your confusion of the scriptures. God will teach you how to understand his word. And then, so this, this one happened first. This one's happening now. But there's a third salvation. And you're going to be saved one day from this tribulation period. Tribulation period. Time of Jacob's trouble. And at the rapture or the resurrection, we're going to be taken out before all of that happens. And you're going to get your new body and all that stuff. You'll be saved from pain and everything else. The point is, that's the salvation he's talking about when God takes us. That's why he says, uh, okay. verse 8, the hope of salvation for, when you see F-O-R, that's continue, continuing the thought that he had before. For God hath not appointed us to what? So. Wrath. To wrath. That's that wrath to come, okay? But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. When we get to chapter 4, because Paul's, you would have already read chapter 4, but we're going to study together. He's going to talk about the rapture. What's going to happen when the Lord comes? He's going to take us out before that. Go over to chapter 5 of Romans. Go to Romans chapter 5. Let me show you that again. Look at Romans chapter number 5. The prophetic scriptures constantly speak about, you heard John the Baptist tell those guys, those Pharisees, he said, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That day of wrath or the day of the Lord, that's a future wrath where God's going to pour his wrath, particularly on, on unbelieving Israel, the, the nations of the earth and the Middle East particularly, and then it's going to filter out to the rest of the world. But it's that wrath to come, that tri great tribulation, 
seven weeks ago, Daniel, this last seven years, the time of Jacob's trouble. Paul says, I mean, John says, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Old generation of vipers. Paul says, God has delivered us from the wrath to come. Let me show you that. Look at Romans 5, verse number... Yeah, let's look at verse 9. Nine. Much more than... Well, i got to get verse 8. But God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? God is not telling you to clean your life up before you can get saved. He's saying you can't get saved in your own strength you're dead. I'll clean you up. Trust my son. It was while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than if he died while we were still sinners, much more than being now justified. How? By his blood. We saw that on Wednesday. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Amen. Amen. Listen, we're going to be saved from that wrath to come. Don't take a look. He has not appointed us to wrath. He has appointed the nation of Israel to wrath. It's called, he has an appointment book. He wrote down the time of Jacob's trouble. God has an appointment book. And you know what angels do? It's scribe angels. They bring books to him. Over in Isaiah it says, it is written in the books before me. You know how those kings, like uh, uh, Mordecai, he was, uh, Mordecai was um, blessed by the king over in Persia there. The Persian king. Mordecai saved uh, the king from a coup d'etat. Uh, th these guys, Big Than and all these guys were going to kill the king. And Mordecai let him know. But the, the, the king didn't reward him right away. So the king can't sleep one night. And he says, bring the books. Bring the books. And so he reads the books. And he goes, did we reward this guy for this? They said, no, king. He says, we got to do that. It says of God, in Isaiah, it says, the God says, it is written before me. They literally, I mean, even at the great white throne, what's going to happen? The books are going to be open. And they're going to say, Lord, here it is. Well, it says it is written before me. God, he has an appointment book. But one thing he hasn't done for you and I as believers today in the body of Christ, in this section of grace, he has not appointed us to wrath. We're going to be taken out, okay? Go back to chapter number, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. So I just want you to understand... It's not the tribulation period. It is the, the tribulation. Paul talks in Romans 5. I didn't show you that, but it says tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience and experience hope. We're going to go. You know, tribulation worketh patience. When people pray to God for more patience, that's not, in my, my humble opinion, that's not a real good prayer to ask God. Tribulation works patience. So if you say, oh God, give me more patience, you're literally asking him to give you more tribulations, is what you're asking. And you don't have to ask for that. You get enough of them being a believer in this world. Look at what he says in verse number 5. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear. Remember how he started the chapter? Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear. Look at verse 1. Paul, he had to know how they were doing. So he wanted to find out, and that's why he said Timothy, verse 5, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. Paul wanted to make sure they were standing fast in the Lord. Notice here, lest by some means the tempter. Now who's the tempter? That's Satan. One of his, that's one of his, his name, the tempter. Have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Can I tell you, as a minister, there's nothing more frustrating except breaking a camera and starting your, your, your morning off like that. But second to that, it's when you invest time, effort, you give of yourself, and it end up in vain because they allow Satan to let him fall away from the truth. Paul, Paul struggled with that his whole entire ministry, not on his part, but on the other part. He so wanted people to stand fast in the faith. I have kept the faith, he said. I kept that. I kept God's word. Look what he says here. Verse number five. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Now, it wasn't like Paul wouldn't get rewarded for this. Paul's going to get rewarded the judgment seat of Christ for his ministry, the fruit of it, whether people stayed with the doctrine or not. Paul wasn't looking for that. He's looking for everybody to get their full reward. He says, not unto me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearance. Paul wasn't just satisfied 
And I bring Ryan up because he travels so far every Wednesday and, and Sunday. He could come here and do this. We just broke the camera. It took him a while. He was trying to get the camera fixed. Now we got to do it off this. He wants other people is the point. He wants other people to get it. He understands that he's valuable to other people who can't be here with us in California here or like some of you guys from Bay Area, you can only come certain. He understands that I need to get these on there so other people can benefit. That's Paul. That's exactly what. Verse number six, he says, but now when Timotheus came from you unto us, so Timothy went there, he came back, gave Paul the good report, and then Paul wrote this book, look at verse six, but now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings, oh, the Bible talks about blessed is the, the feet of, of, of him who brings good tidings, right? Oh, yeah. Do you understand that when, I, I get it, man, when you find out somebody, we get people's uh, testimony, and we find out they come to know the rightly divided word, the grace message, what a comfort that is. Chris and I just rejoice over it, because I can see how, that's why Paul, look what he says, but now when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith, not just their faith, and charity, they were served in the Lord by serving one another. That's also called the labor of love, charity is the labor of love. Your faith and charity, but, but but keep this in mind, and that you have, what type of remembrance of them? Good remembrance of us always. When they looked at the Apostle Paul and thought about when he was there, they didn't say, boy, wherever that Paul went, there was trouble. They didn't say that. Hmm. All that trouble that, that, that came with the Apostle Paul because of the satanic policy of evil, they, these people were rejoicing in it. They wanted to see him. You have good remembrance of us always. Oh, look at that. Desiring how greatly to see us as we also to see you. You remember what we saw in our Colossians study? Paul says, what great conflict I have. Those who haven't seen my face in the flesh, just your very presence can affect people. Positive or negative. The saddest thing that's going to happen this Wednesday when my parents-in-law go back to Minnesota to watch my six-year-old she is a mess when they leave. We're driving back from the airport, and for like the whole next couple of days, she's crying. She's trying, I'm sorry to tell you all this now, but you know. It's hard because we live here, and, and they have grandchildren in Minnesota and in Washington. Their very presence, Jada Lynn is bouncing off the walls, man. Just their presence. She talks to them on the phone, she can FaceTime, whatever, but the very presence is a blessing. And the opposite is true. When they go on Wednesday, we drop them off at the airport, it's going to be hard on the ride home <laughs> with the little girl. But that's life, you know. She knows. She's sitting again soon. The point is, Paul understood that his very presence was needed to strengthen saints. I get a little of this when we go back to Minnesota and see the saints from our old ministry. It's a, it's a weird dynamic. The, they just get to see you in the flesh. You get to see them. We saw Bob and Rita last week. It was it was great to be with them. We miss them. Rita's brother, John, was part of our ministry there. Every time I look at her and heard her with her Minnesota accent and see her face, look like her, remind me of her brother. It was, it, was, it was good and sad because I miss these folks. But their physical presence, and, and my presence and Krista's presence with them was encouraging. That's the point. When, you, when, when we see all you all, it's encouraging. Exactly. That's the hardest part in dealing with saints from afar because you can't give them that same dynamic, you know? And that's why we do go back to Minnesota outside of just seeing Chris's family, but to, to, it's so encouraging, it strengthens them and it strengthens us. That's what Paul is dealing with here. Notice here. He says, greatly desiring in the verse 6 to see us as we also see you. Therefore, brethren, we are comforted over you. In all our affliction. Listen, when Paul left Thessalonica and went to Berea, he went to Athens, he went to Corinth, Acts, before that in Philippi, Acts 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, goes to Ephesus. Everywhere he went, Satan was throwing bombs at him, spiritually speaking, was attacking him because he's the apostle of grace. And through all of that affliction, all Paul needs to know is that some people who he established that grace church in Thessalonica 
were still with him and with the Lord. That's comforting as a minister. To know you might not see them for a while, but they say, brother, I, I, I'll get people. I answer questions and stuff. And so maybe I haven't talked to them in a couple of years or three years. And I'll just get an email or a text and I say, hey, brother Ryan, it's been a while, but here's what's been going on. And, and they're not only in the, still in the faith, they're, they're, they're serving and stuff, and we're just rejoicing. I can see that. And no matter what you're going through, because their faith. No, notice what he said, verse, verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you and all our affliction and distress. How did they work? How were they comforted? By your what? Faith. faith. What the Lord Jesus Christ desires above all is faith. Believing God's word. You remember that Gentile? The Lord asked, the Lord was asked to come to this Gentile's house. He was a, 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 a centurion. And that centurion's servant was sick. He sends, he sends other servants to the Lord Jesus and says, please come and heal my servant. You know what the Jews said? They said, Lord, do it. He's worthy of it because he loves our people and he built us a synagogue. Jesus Christ would not heal a Gentile anything unless they did this. They had to bless Israel first. Okay, Abraham kept coming. Genesis, uh, Genesis 12. Who serves to bless you shall be blessed. Who curse you, be cursed. And through you shall all the families, and your seed shall all the families and nations of the earth be blessed. When they, th that Gentile had no claim on the Messiah, right? What did Paul say? You Gentiles had, were without Christ and had no hope in the world, right? Ephesians 2. When that woman in Matthew 15, she was a Gentile, Syrophoenician, Greek woman. She had a little daughter. So a woman and her little daughter. You can't get much weaker than that. She's begging the Lord to heal her. Oh, son of, you know, son of David, have mercy. He answered her not a word. He just ignored her. He just walked by. He says, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He finds Israelis everywhere. He, he come to them. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Lord, I, I don't have nobody. Do you want to be healed? Well, nobody can put me. Do you want to be healed? Gentiles, he walked right past them. Didn't Because I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then they said, even though he's a Gentile, Lord, he is worthy because he... He, he blesses our people. He built us a synagogue. And, and because he blessed Israel, Christ went to heal his servant, right? But what happened? On the way there, he says, nope, I'm not worthy. Just speak the word only, right? My servant should be healed. He says, I'm a man under authority. I got a command. I can tell somebody to do it. They'll do it. You can do that same thing with your word. And you know what the Lord Jesus said about that Gentile heathen? He says, I have not seen such great faith. No, not in Israel. Are you guys familiar with this passage? Mm -hmm. I don't want to, if it's foreign, it's a good passage. No, but we can look at it if you want in the Q&A. He says, I have not seen such great faith. No, not in Israel. He was astounded at this Gentile's faith. And the other thing that ever astounded, I only see the Lord Jesus really astounded twice. When that Gentile had great faith, and when the people of Israel had lack of faith. <clears throat> When he was going to heal Lazarus in John chapter 11, they were crying and weeping. And they were like, oh, Lord, we know that you're going to raise him up at the last day. He says, I am the resurrection. They are crying because he's dead. And they have the Lord Jesus, the life, the resurrection of life in his, in his presence. And it, it, when he wept, it wasn't because of Lazarus being dead. He let him die. He waited when he was sick. He waited a few days. The point is, he was weeping because of their unbelief. Lack of faith makes God astounded. Faith, particularly the faith of a Gentile, he had more faith than those Jews. That's what Paul is saying. God loves faith. The Apostle Paul had that same mind. Look at verse 8. For now we live. Now, he's not talking about physical life there. You know, he's going to live physically whether they have faith. And if the Romans wanted to take his life, you know, in God's time whether they stand fast in the faith or not, won't affect his physical life. When he says live, you know how people talk about, I'm living the dream. We got a friend, Steve Reed, back in Minnesota. He's a, he's a comedian. He goes, you say, how you doing? He says, I'm living the dream. <laughs> he's a grace believer. He's a believer. He'd be at a restaurant, and the, and the waitress would come. You know how they say, 
how's everything? How's everything? Is it good? And most people say, oh, it's good. But he goes, pretty adequate. <laughs> he says, subpar, subpar. And you look at their face, they go, subpar what? He goes, just playing. Uh, John, John and, uh, and, and, and Diane are here. We were uh, in Mercy Hospital in Coon Rapids. Krista's pregnant with Jada Lamb. Uh, Steve, Steve came to visit. And uh, we were on the, the ward with the pregnant lady. So they all nine months pregnant walking around or stuff. And Steve's in his room with him. And he looks over. And John, you remember more. He goes, so what, do you, what brings you in here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> This pregnant woman, she's looking at him like, I'm pregnant. You know, <laughs> He's silly. Oh, he's a nut. But he is, he is a believer. And when Paul says live, he's talking about living in Christ. His faith, he says your faith. Look at verse 8. For now we live. You guys make life worth living because you're responding to the doctrine. For now we live if ye, and what's our title? Stand fast in the Lord. Over in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, be steadfast, unmovable. Let's look at it. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. As we come down to him. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. You know, I have the privilege of being in ministry, and, and that, this is true, I mean, it's God's word, but to experience that, it, it matters when people stand fast in the truth. Uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15. These carnal saints, but God's word can work if they believe it. Verse 57, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, the righteous judge. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain, where? In the Lord. When you're doing it motivated by the Lord Jesus Christ and the judgment seat of Christ, it's not in vain. It's fruit abound to your account. You know that word steadfast? I got a little note here. You guys see my body, you see all these great, one, I just write my little notes. And I got like Ruth in Ruth 1.14. Evidently, if I can remember now why I wrote that, when Naomi was going to head back to Israel, she was a Jewish woman. Her husband died and her sons died. And her sons happened to be, a couple of her sons had to be, happened to be married to Ruth the Moabites, and Oprah. Oprah. Oprah, yeah. Oprah. They, they, they're trying to name her. <laughs> Oprah, okay. Oprah. Oprah, yeah. Well, she tells them, go back to your people and to your God. Let's look at that, because I want to see what steadfastness, what it looks like. If we need to have that same, if we come down here, we need to have that same attitude. Go to the book of Ruth, if you will. All the way back to the book of Ruth there. I wrote it there. That means it, it, it was caught my eye there. Judges, you go all the way back to the beginning. Judges, then you got Book of Ruth. Uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. I'll uh, take a little water while you're finding them. We hardly get to the Book of Ruth, but it's a wonderful little short book. You know, I think it's like what four, four chapters. Mm -hmm. Real short. It's a beautiful love story about Israel and their Messiah because Ruth turns out to be a type of the Gentiles who come into the kingdom and Boaz represents the Lord Jesus Christ. A kinsman redeemer. And this kinsman redeemer, the fact that the Lord Jesus became a man. He's going to save humanity. Well, Ruth Let's look at that. There's a famine. Look at verse, chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, this is during the, the judges' period, they didn't have a king, that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, interesting, that's where the Lord's from, I mean, uh, David, the, the David's lineage, some of it, went to so sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech. Elima, I can never say this man's name. Elimelech. 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 
My tongue from the hood, man. <laughs> Elimelech. Elimelech. Okay, that's tough. For real, I can't say. Elimelech. I can't say this Hebrew name. You know, Elimelech means my God is king. And the name of his wife, Naomi. You know what Naomi, I have a aunt named Naomi. It means beautiful, agreeable, lovable, and delightful. She is that way, I guess. She a, she a, she a, she a, she a, she a sister from the hood in Chicago. Don't, don't get on the bad side, okay? Well, notice, they have sons. Verse number three, and Emma, uh, uh, Elimelech, and Naomi's husband died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. Wrong, uh, that was a bad decision right off right there. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. Okay? Ruth's, Ruth's, you know what Ruth's name means? Anybody know? It means satisfied. Satisfied. Interesting. And they dwelt there about ten years. Ten is the number of testimony, responsibility, and so forth. And Malon and Chilon died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Now, I'm getting to the point about the steadfast. Here we go. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people, Israel and Judah there, and giving them bread. So everybody got that? She left because of the famine, but now she can go back. All right, here we go. Verse 7. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law. Now watch what she says, everybody. She's a Jew. They're Moabites. Here we go. Verse 7. Verse 8, pardon me. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each, of, uh, each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead, that's their husbands, and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest. By the way, that's what a husband is to do, give rest. Rest each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Now notice at first both of the daughter-in-laws wanted to go with her, right? Look at verse 10, verse uh, 11. And Naomi said, turn again, my daughters, why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb? Naomi's an old lady, she's not having more boys. And even so, for, for them to wait for them to grow up, it would, they would be old. So here's the, here's the point, that they may be your husbands. Verse 12, turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband, if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons. She says, look, if I get married right now, and in nine months have children, that's what she's saying, would ye tarry, you know, some years for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? You guys going to stay single until they grow up? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is going out against me. Verse 14, and they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law. Now, here's the point about steadfast. Standing fast. But Ruth, what's that next word? Clave unto her. What is clave? Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. She stuck with her. Like glue. Watch what she said. Now, people use this in their weddings and stuff like that. They just take it out of context. And I get the point, you know, your God be my God. And but this is what she's saying. She's a Gentile, verse 15. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people. Oprah, Oprah left. And said, uh, and by the way, her people and her what? Her gods. Ah, her gods. Small G. Yeah. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be, uh, and thy God my God. Verse 18. When she saw that she, Ruth, was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Everybody get that? Mm -hmm. You want steadfastness? Wherever Paul goes, you go. You cleave. Yeah. 
steadfastly minded. By the way, it's a mindset, right? Steadfast. When Paul says be steadfast, when he says stand fast in the Lord, you make sure that righteous judge is who you are serving and, and you're going to follow in the truth. Don't let it go. And what happened when Ruth went back to the land of Israel, the land of Judah? She met Boaz, right. and the rest is history. God provided. Ruth is in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because mm -hmm. Boaz and Ruth had Obed, Obed had Jesse, Jesse had David, right. and the rest is history. You see, just, the, the, just being steadfast in who God is and the truth, there's the blessing, right? Oh, no, That's right. If you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you, should you die today? <laughs> When you go to heaven, when you go to hell. If so, how do you know for sure? There's no way in the good and bad and all that because you can't bring forth good in your dead position spiritually. But you can get life, and that life is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He shed, he gave his life so that we might have life. He shed his blood. Why blood? The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make on the altar to make atonement for your souls. The only atonement that we can get is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You trust him alone today, God will save you forever. But what to do after you're saved? Well, you need to be prepared for the judgment seat of Christ. God wants you to have faith. That's what pleases God. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6. The point is, we can help you build your faith. Do the work of faith. Uh, for those who listen by way of internet, Contact Brother Matthew here. He has some nice phone covers with, with Bible verses. 1 Thessalonians 1, 3 is his verse. The work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope. We'll help you with all of those things. That's what our ministry exists for. All right? Let's pray. For gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in Him. May we, like uh, Ruth, that Moabitess, who ends up being part of the seed vine, her own blood in the Lord Jesus Christ through David. Simply because she says, I'm going to stay, stay steadfast with the God of Israel. Now, Father, that was in time past. You're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're in you when we trust the Lord Jesus. But we too can be steadfast in standing for the truth of the gospel of grace and standing in the doctrine of grace, Paul's gospel. Thank you for that privilege and honor and opportunity, Father. What a great honor it is to serve you in the grace of God. May that be what we give ourselves to. May we be steadfast. May we cleave to the Lord Jesus Christ through his word and spirit. Thank you, Father, for this time together. We ask you to bless our time in the Q&A and um, in, in our visiting um, with one with another. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.